Let's go to Donald Trump. This was after the Brussels attacks. Donald Trump repeating his endorsement of the use of waterboarding of suspects. I'm not looking for breaking news on your show, but frankly, uh, the waterboarding is it was up to me. Uh, and if we change the laws and or have the laws, uh, waterboarding would be fine. And if they want to do as long as it's with, because you know we work within laws, they don't work within laws. They have no laws. We work within laws. Uh, the waterboarding would be fine. And if they could expand the laws, I would do a lot more than waterboarding. You have to get the information from these people, and we have to be smart and we have to be tough and. We can't be soft and weak, which is what we are right There's now. That. We can't be soft and weak as he endorses torture. Well, there are. I, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, we can't be soft and weak from a non veteran. Uh, I think veterans in general get so frustrated with this tough talk and this idea that these men, and quite frankly, some women, have any idea what, it, what the difference between soft and weak and tough and hard is. Um, this is not about being soft and weak. This is about being smart. And, and far more importantly, this is, about, this is about being Americans. And it's about uh, adhering to the values that, that make us Americans, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And those, I'm not suggesting that we read the Miranda rights to prisoners of war or that we give them constitutional rights, but we absolutely are obligated to treat them humanely. Abu Ghraib, what it meant to the Iraqis and the fact that you were doing this there. I've suggested, um, that the, that the word Alcatraz has, a, has kind of a similar meaning to Americans. So Americans hear the term Alcatraz and they think of a difficult prison. But over the course of the last few years, I've recognized that that's not true, that, that we don't really have a word in, in the English language that, um, that sounds the same way as Abu Ghraib for, for Iraqis. Um, many Iraqis that I spoke to, interrogated uh, at Abu Ghraib, had been there under Saddam Hussein. Uh, and it had been a return. It may very had well— Had been imprisoned, then. Had been in, imprisoned under Saddam Hussein, either for being Shia or they had, they had fled during the Iran-Iraq war, uh, for any number of different reasons, or for no reason at all. So uh, Abu Ghraib had a—the um, idea that we would, we would uh, empty out that prison and turn it back into a prison of war camp was the very definition of, of foolish. And do you recall when you first saw the images, uh, the first images that were released from Abu Ghraib in, in Sy Hirsch's uh, New Yorker piece, and why you think uh, in the U.S. people were so shocked by those images? I was in Fallujah at the time. We had access to Armed Forces Network, um, so I, I'm not sure that I saw it as breaking news, but we eventually kind of felt the story coming out and, and people talking about it. Um, and as I've said before, I, we, we weren't shocked, and so we weren't f afraid to see this stuff coming out, because uh, we had figured all along that people knew about this. I think in some ways we were shocked that the American people were so shocked. Uh, and that they they had this kind of idea, or, or that they were so ignorant about about what was going on. Now, some of the images uh, that we saw were, were unfamiliar to me. Mock, mock execution uh, that showed up and the use of dogs were not things that I had seen or done. But I'm also not here to suggest that I would not have done those things. Right? The story remains about my confession, my own failures. Uh, if someone had come into my interrogation booth with a dog and said, "This is a useful tool," uh, I may very well, I may very well have used it. Well, in writing this book, could you say a little about what you want Americans to learn from it, your audiences who read the book? Well, I think any uh, drone strikes have become, a, uh, have become the, the new topic. And I think if Americans had a better sense of what a drone strike really was, if we, if we saw digital photographs of the after effects of a drone strike up close, I think we'd be having an enormous discussion about the uh, efficacy of, of drone strikes, or certainly a different discussion. And I think we need to have that different discussion about issues like interrogation. A year or two ago, I, uh, people, as I, as I got ready to publish this book, people, the question being asked was, why are we still talking about this? Why is this still an issue? Well, we've seen with the clips from, the, from, from Donald Trump and Ted Cruz and many others that uh, aggressive interrogation and torture and enhanced techniques remain uh, something that it's a door that is still, is still wide open. Those of us who are there need to tell our stories. We need to be honest about it. And we need to let the American people have a really good look at what this stuff was. You talk about um, this being a confession, and you talk about your religious background. A confession is for sins. Are these crimes? Do you feel you committed crimes? So uh, this will sound like a dodge, but as a, as a police officer, when I when I uh, pulled someone over or pulled them on the side of the street, um, I did not ask them whether or not they felt they had committed a crime. Their sort of view in that process meant nothing. They were, it was to be, it was up to me, and it was up to what would then essentially be a judge. Um, 
I feel the same way about this sort of process. I have an absolute obligation uh, to be as honest and as clear as I possibly can with these things. That being said, if a friend of mine came to me um, and as, a, as a former police officer and said, Eric, um, I have these memories, I did these things, what's the best way not to be prosecuted? Um, the last thing I would do is say, write a book. Right? I would not. So I'm aware. I, I recognize your question and I know um, the possibilities here. But that's not something that has anything to do. My opinion in there means really nothing. If you saw the people do um, what you saw them do in places like Fallujah and Abu Ghraib, uh, you're the other interrogators, people work for khaki or the U.S. military, um, would you arrest them if you were a policeman? No, I, I would not have. Uh, and I, it sort of—I don't know if that brings us back or starts a whole new discussion. But again, when we were there in Iraq, we were never under the impression that we were doing anything illegal. Whether or not we thought we were doing something wrong, I think, is a much broader question. I think some of them, like me, were, were confused and not certain. Others quit immediately. There were people that showed up, saw it, quit, and then others who certainly stayed uh, long term. You talk about Hans Scharf. Explain who he is. So, Hans Scharf was a, a, a Nazi interrogator in World War II, and he was uh, known specifically for interrogating uh, downed uh, American pilots and airmen. And Hans Scharf became famous for never using any aggressive techniques, and he was, quite frankly, the most effective Nazi interrogator. Um, and he would take the American pilots for walks in the woods, and he would get to know, uh, he would talk to them about their families. He had lived in the United States, so he could relate to them in terms of the universities they had gone to. Uh, and they formed relationships. And he ended up acquiring an enormous amount of, of valuable intelligence information. Now, that, those relationships were so good that, that he had developed that, after the war, that uh, a number of the Americans that he had actually interrogated invited him back over to the United States for Christmas dinner. And he eventually became a U.S. citizen, a naturalized U.S. citizen, and went on to teach uh, interrogation, I believe, to the, to the U.S. Air Force. And what do you think, uh, Eric Fair? do you believe that people who sanctioned these, meth uh, these uh, methods um, should, in any sense, be charged? Again, I, that, that is not why I've written this book, and that's not—I I, I recognize the value of that discussion, and I'm not suggesting that it's one that shouldn't be had out in the open. Uh, but that's—my experience doesn't speak to that, to, that, to that issue. Were you ever stunned by someone who came and left and said, I can't do this? If I'm being honest, um, for the people that, that quit immediately, we, we thought negatively of them. Um, and we thought that they were simply not, not up to the task, which is one of the reasons why, even as I began to have my, my own sort of moral questions, that I, I hung on as long as I did. Um, there was a view, we'd, most of us have been soldiers or Marines, and the idea that you quit something uh, didn't sit well with all of us. So how do, do you live with this now? How does this affect you physically and emotionally? Well, it's something that, uh, that I continue to live with every day, and, and I suspect that I will, and I suspect that I should. Uh, this, I mean, this clearly has had some, uh, some negative effects on me, but nothing like the negative effects of, of the prisoners that, that we encountered in Iraq, uh, which, again, is then, and then circles back to why I continue to struggle. I know that a part of me is still with those prisoners, those that are alive. Uh, with those prisoners in Iraq. Explain um, what you mean, those that well, are the, alive. Well, the violence that, that ensued in Iraq over the... This was 2004, when I was there. Uh, the number of people that were killed, and again, maybe most Americans don't like to think about this, but the bloodletting was on a biblical scale in terms of 2005, 2006, 2007. Um, I, I can't say for sure, I don't know, but I suspect that certainly some of the people that I talked to became victims of that violence. And large parts, before we conclude, large parts of the later chapters of your memoir are redacted. Uh, could you explain who's responsible for that and sure. why those bits were redacted? So I talked about not wanting to quit because it was part of, of sort of who we had been taught to be. And so even though when I did leave uh, Iraq the first time, my intention was to return a second. And so the second time that I returned in 2005 was with the National Security Agency. I'd actually worked for them very briefly prior to my first deployment. So this was my second stint. Now, anytime you publish anything about the National Security Agency, you're required to go through pre-publication review. Um, and I'd signed that agreement, and I, I, so I fulfilled my obligation. And this, the redacted sections are what the NSA essentially decided was not something for the public. Um, how many of those at Abu Ghraib did you feel were innocent? Uh, the Red Cross would estimate between 70 and 90 percent of the prisoners um, in uh, had been arrested by mistake. 
Yeah, there are, there are so many different ways to answer that question, right? Who exactly was guilty at Abu Ghraib? Why were we there in the first place? Why were they in prison? Um, certainly, there were men in that prison, some of whom I talked to, uh, deserved, quite frankly, to spend the rest of their lives in a cell. Um, but as far as who was innocent and who was guilty, what exactly? They were, they were Iraqis. It was their country, right? And they absolutely should have been trying to oust us. So, uh, I, I've heard those percentages, and I recognize, again, again, what you're getting at. But um, I don't like the idea that it was okay to sort of uh, torture some of these guys who were guilty, and, but it was not. It was simply wrong to do it to, to anyone who was there. Well, in, uh, you also say that in the context of the violence that was inflicted on Iraqis, uh, you say, quote, it's a just punishment for us that we suffer some of the consequences. So could you say what you think the consequences for the United States and people here have been? I don't think, I don't think that story's written yet, and, and I think that should be frightening on, on some level. Uh, I had ended my very first opinion piece in 2007 by suggesting that the uh, that the, the consequences of, of uh, imprisoning large numbers of people are, are typically huge. And, and the names that you can start ticking off in terms of people that spent time in oppressive in prison environments and then came on to be just monsters in history is a long list. Uh, we are 12, 12 years removed from Abu Ghraib. We are zero, zero years removed from Guantanamo Bay. Uh, there remain detention facilities in places like Afghanistan and probably Iraq. I don't know what those consequences are. Some of them, at this point, are unavoidable. But I do feel that if we address this issue and that we do have a significant change uh, and we do go back to the, essentially those core values, that we absolutely will treat prisoners of war humanely and that we broadcast that, that we can, we can shift the narrative. Eric Fair, thank you for being with us. Army veteran who worked as a contract negotiator at Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq, as well as other places. He worked for Khaki. He is the author of the new book, Consequence, a Memoir. This is Democracy Now!